Weisel Hawk is a serial entrepreneur, thought and practice leader, and author. He's the founder of several organizations, one of which is Shadoka, who through its portfolio of companies accelerates individual and organizational sustainable growth. Hawk is a regular contributor to Fast Company and the Huffington Post, and his work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Forbes, and Leadership Excellence. His latest book, published by McGraw-Hill, is Everything Connects, How to Transform and Lead in the Age of Creativity, Innovation, and Sustainability. Soundview is very pleased to welcome the author of Everything Connects, Mr. Faisal Hawk. Faisal, welcome to Soundview Live. Thank you for having me, Andrew. So, um, you know, what we're going to do is, is this, uh, in next one hour, we'll talk about uh, obviously how to lead uh, in the age of innovation, but uh, we're going to take a slightly different bent than uh, your typical conversation about innovation and uh, transformation and creativity because I'm, much, I'm, I'm very much of a believer that uh, all this starts, uh, uh, this kind of thinking and, and the work we do starts with yourself. So we're going to first talk about how do we really connect with ourselves uh, and then we're going to talk about how to connect with other people. Uh, and then, as a result, we get to innovate uh, and create value. And in the context of value, the value, definition of value, uh, I have a slightly different definition of value in the sense that value is, is defined by what you consider value and what your organization considers value. So, so um, I'm looking forward to... Uh, this next one hour, and uh, we'll talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll open up for conversation. So um, a little bit of background, aside from what Andrew said, uh, you know, so I wrote this book. Uh, this is my, uh, uh, I've written several books prior to this book, but this book was uh, very much of a personal journey. And often when you kind, uh, when you write a book of this nature, uh, you uh, kind of have an opportunity to reflect on your successes, but also on your failures and the trials and tribulation uh, and, and um, you know, the, the, the way you go about from your stage, uh, from one stage to another stage and from one uh, transformation to one, another transformation. And in the, in, whenever I'm talking about transformation, I'm not talking about just organizational transformation. I'm talking about personal transformation. So this was a very interesting journey for me. Uh, and and uh, so, so a lot of the things that I talk about in this book and what we'll be talking about in next, uh, uh, next uh, hour or so is very much of a both personal and professional uh, journey. So uh, that's the context. So in that context, uh, you know, what, what I would, would like to first set the stage as that is what I started talking about is that the, even though we have uh, major technological cha changes and social behaviors are changing, and as a result, we have much bigger opportunity to create, to innovate, uh, and, and also create sustainability for ourselves both from a growth point of view, but also from an economic point of view, uh, many of this uh, stuff is very much relates to how we think about uh, us as person and how we connect with our 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 uh, personal traits, and then how does that uh, relate to uh, these things that we talk about innovation and creativity and uh, sustainability. And believe it or not, one of the things I have found out over throughout my career uh, is that, you know, the, this, many of these new things that we talk about, you know, the technological innovation and business model innovation, uh, many of the challenges are very old in the sense that it's really about how we conduct ourselves and how we behave on a daily basis and how does that drives our authentic journey towards creation and towards innovation and towards creating value. And that's why we talk about this notion of everything connects, meaning how you look at yourself, how you relate to other people, and as a result, how that creates value and how does that create innovation and how does that uh, create value, they're all interconnected. And, and, um, and when you are talking about this connectivity, 
I'm not really talking about how do you connect with people on social media or how you connect with people in the context of, you know, uh, digital connections. Uh, obviously, that's a big part of how we live today, but it's far more important to look at how you connect with yourself. So let me give you some background, a uh, part, little bit of personal background, and that I think will will um, uh, set up uh, some context, uh, you know, in terms of what we're going to talk about in coming uh, minutes and coming hour. So, uh, you know, as I started saying, is this connectivity is very much of a sense of journey or, or it's a sense of purpose, and it's both individual as well as both organizational, and it's how uh, we connect with the rest of the world. So, you know, I originally come from Bangladesh. Uh, I've been, I came here when I was 17 years old, and I'm been to U.S., and uh, since then I have been kind of going through several transformations, both personal and organizational. So when I came to, uh, to U.S. Uh, first, uh, I came here as a student, and I had to kind of survive uh, in order to put myself to school, um, and I did all kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, all type of work, uh, including a, a pretty serious stint as a janitor, uh, in graveyard shift, and 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 that kind of set the background uh, where I, you know, uh, how my journey started. And and since then, uh, I went to work for very large companies like Dun and Bradstreet and Pitney Bowes, and started my own company. And I ended up going to GE, uh, did a, a, a GE stint where we were the first people to introduce e-commerce for business to business space in 1995-1996 time frame and then post that um, I uh, started my next company raised lots of uh, venture funding I got fired from my own company uh, and restarted my next company that was focused on business and technology transformation uh, continued that for next 10 plus years and then I reinvented myself again two couple of years ago where my uh, ideas and thoughts changed and, and my, what I wanted to do changed in the context of that. I wanted to impact next generation entrepreneurs and small businesses versus the large Fortune 500s that I have been uh, catering towards. So I started this new venture, which has now a several portfolio companies. So and even though I'm a hardcore technologist uh, and I have been kind of uh, always in this, um, you know, loosely defined space called innovation and innovative product with technology that has business impact, last few years I have been very much focused on uh, these, what drives us as, as people in terms of our inner energy and inner passion and how do we uh, you know how we cultivate that and how we how we move that forward with a authentic calling uh, and how does that translate into um, um, in how we connect with other people and how we create these innovative uh, uh, things or offerings or value that we want to create for other people that's kind of uh, what manifested into this new book that I have just uh, written with uh, with a, uh, a very talented journalist who helped me to pull together a lot of case studies, not just from my own life, but from other other uh, other successes and failures. And they are really multifaceted because uh, we looked into uh, you know 2,000 plus years of philosophical. Uh, mindset of, of Eastern philosophies uh, and, and people like Da Vinci, but we also looked at a new generation organization like Netflix and Google and, and, and others. And so it's a very interesting uh, process of connecting these dots from the old world and the new world and looking at how uh, uh, we can look into uh, progressing our, our journey uh, as people, but also as organization, and, and both from a new generation of uh, innovation, but also from, uh, from uh, you know, keeping ourselves grounded. So, so the first part, I, first thing I want to talk about uh, is that how do you really nurture your authentic self? You know, how do you really find out 
what is it that you want to do, uh, you know, and, and how does that wanting to do has actually connects to creating any value. So, um, you know, and, you know, we all talk about this notion of, uh, you know, you can't really move towards the, uh, any kind of significant achievement un- unless and until you um, really cultivate your passion. But passion is the, fir- you know, it's, it's very first element of, uh, of this, this, this uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, equation in the sense that passion alone is not enough. It takes a lot more than passion to, to cultivate uh, your authentic self. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Stephen Pressfield, uh, which you might have read some of his work. Um, you know, you might have seen a movie called the, uh, you know, the the Baggervents, uh, the Legend of Baggervents, which is really around um, a, go- a story of a golfer from down south in the U.S. and how he had to find his way. But uh, Stephen Pressfield writes about authentic calling, and he writes about. Um, you know, what is it that we have to do to cultivate our authentic calling? And, and reality is that, you know, each one of us, whether we are an author or whether you, you are a technologist or you're an entrepreneur or an innovator or a leader or whether you're working in an academic setting, we all have our own set of offerings, our unique uh, uh, self that that, uh, that world needs. The, the, the trick is, how do you find that out, and how do you uh, really uh, cultivate that? And 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 so so this is why I I have this quote uh, which you may be seeing on your screen from Stephen Pressfield, which is really talks about everybody who creates operates from their uh, inner sanctum. You know, it's it's the soul, it's your soul, it's your vassal uh, that carries whatever that you want to portray to the world. So you know, and it's it's applicable to anybody and everybody. So if you look at somebody like Albert Einstein, or if you look at Da Vinci, or if you look at, uh, you know, um, new generation uh, uh, technologist or, or entrepreneurs like uh, Bill Gates or, uh, you know, uh, or people like uh, uh, Steve Jobs or whoever, or, or the people that you work with on a regular basis who are not so famous, they all have their unique way and unique things to offer to the world. And this uh, unique way and offering only becomes a reality when we bring that with other people's help and we cultivate uh, other people's talent along with ours uh, and that brings it, it comes to a reality. So, and even this book that I have just written, and, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have come uh, to a reality if I didn't have this very talented co-author and I didn't work with my publishers and my editors and, and whatnot. So cultivation of this unique self requires other people. So, so first we have to figure out what that unique calling is and how we collect this, uh, 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 you know, how we be, be very aware of what is it that we are trying to cultivate. So, you know, I talk about this um, thing about being awake or being mindful, and it's a, it's not that often people talk about mindfulness or being awake or being authentic in the context of uh, hardcore business in the sense that, you know, I mean, when we talk about leading and transformation, I mean, we really, usually people talk about, especially the business leaders talks about in the context of organizational structure and process, and that's how you transform. But I, I argue that, you know, this, this, this idea of transformation and idea of, of creation or idea of leading comes from being very mindful or awake of your self-existence and your own self-motivation uh, and how you want to take your inner passion and manifest that into reality. And, and this idea of mindfulness, you know, is, is, is a thought of um, being aware of how you want to look at it, look at what you want to do and how you want to do it. And actually, it's very difficult because, you know, we all struggle with what is it that we want to do uh, and that, that we think that may or may not add value to the world and be very assured that whatever it is that we think it is unique about us and we want to, um, you know, uh, roll that out to the, to the rest of the world is, you know, having that confidence level and having that, that skill set and having that uh, ecosystem, which we'll talk about it later a bit, uh, 
comes together, you know, uh, to, to manifest that into reality. And mindfulness is this notion of being awake uh, of what we want to do, how we want to do it, and how we want to nurture it on a daily basis that moves us forward. So, you know, in terms of being mindful, I would argue that you, you need couple, you know, three things, which is really comes from a lot of these Eastern philosophical way of looking at it. In the main, in the thing that you have to be, have to have the right intention. What is it that you want to do? And behind that right intention, you have to give the right effort. Uh, and this, I, this intersection of right effort and right intention is what allows us to be mindful. And when we are very devoted about our intention and our, our um, um, you know, uh, what is it that we want to uh, do, that's when uh, 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 things become a reality. So I, I give you a um, simple example of, of, of a basketball player. You know, I mean, we all know the story of Michael Jordan used to go get up middle of the night and, and shoot hoops, and, and that crafted his, his thinking of, of how he wants to play the ball and how he wants to make a mark in the world. And this ritualistic behavior is what we call devotion, meaning that crafting, you know, become a master at your craft comes from this devotion uh, or ritualistic behavior or practicing over and over again with the right intention and the right mindset. And what's, that's really about self-leadership. And when we have the self-leadership, only then we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, lead other people. And, you know, and by the way, to be authentic and to, to be able to lead with our own thoughts and idea uh, requires a lot of resiliency because the resiliency, um, uh, 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 because, you know, we all face a lot of adversity. You know, we face adversity in terms of when we want to take our ideas to the to, to, to manifest into reality or when we want to uh, uh, create a new offering or we want to create a new, new company or we want to write a new book, we face lots of adversity. And that adversity uh, it really comes from having the resiliency to overcome whatever adversity uh, that's coming to, towards us. So you know, I told you this story of me coming here when I was 17 years old. I hardly had any money, and I had to survive, and I had to put myself to, to school, and, you know, I wanted to create my own company, which I was able to create my own company, but then I got fired from my own company, so I had to recreate my, myself time and time again. So this, this idea of resiliency is directly related to uh, whether your authenticity, authenticity has a chance to survive and to manifest into reality, because if you're not uh, resilient, and if you are not able to protect your dream and your, your desire, and you don't know how to suffer well, which is in a subject by in itself, which we'll talk maybe at a, some other uh, um, webinar in the future, but this authenticity and this idea of being very awake, what you want to do, and resiliency is the connection to yourself, which then allows us to connect with, uh, with, with the rest of the world. So, Authenticity requires resiliency, and resiliency comes from the idea of being able to protect our own dream and our desires and being able to suffer well through that process and not, not, not give, it, give up and, and, and lead ourselves so that we can be, not just be inspired, but also have the ability to inspire others so that we can um, you know, take our ideas forward uh, in, the, in the next phase. So once we know how to lead ourselves, that's when we can know how to bring other people to the picture and to, to bring them uh, to, to, to support our ideas and our thoughts to the, to the next level. And by the way, I mean, these things uh, I'm talking about, there's nothing new about it, but it, it is very difficult to connect this dot about how do we lead ourselves with the authentic mindset and be aware of it with a devotion and with a set of ritualistic practices and then how we connect our other other that we need because nobody sub succeeds in silence we all need other people to 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 help us to uh, carry our goal so so to understand 
uh, the, 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 uh, this notion of uh, we need other people, we actually have to understand that, uh, you know, just like life uh, in work, uh, you know, we need traveling partners. And, you know, and I use this metaphor of traveling partners loosely, but it's very powerful in the sense that you can think about taking a journey, uh, you know, and, and that could be like as simple as going and having a dinner. When you have a bad dinner companion, no matter how good the food is, uh, you know, the dinner is usually not that good. You don't, you don't have a good experience. So to, in order to create a good experience, you need the right traveling partner. Uh, and, and this idea of traveling partner is what makes uh, a journey successful, right? And I learned very, uh, uh, you know, very painfully when you have wrong a traveling partner, how your venture or how your project or how your experience turns out to be uh, a bad experience. So, for example, um, and by the way, the traveling partner doesn't have a background, right? Because what makes it interesting is when you have these traveling partners from many different experiences, and we call about diversity of experience. You know, diversity of experience is what makes a, a conversation or a project or a venture very, very successful. And, and, and you almost want uh, your traveling partners being on a different bent to what you are about and what you do. So I was uh, sharing with you that, that this project, uh, this book that I wrote with, with the uh, co-author, he comes from a very different background. He's a very talented journalist. And, but we have one common thread of what our passion is about philosophy and and business models and, and life in general, but he is you know, a lot younger than me, but our collective experience what made this uh, journey of writing this book very successful. And what, what is important to understand is that you know, as a leader, we almost have to uh, become a curator uh, of these different experiences that allows us to succeed as, as a team. And, you know, and I use this term curator loosely, but it's also, again, a very powerful metaphor, just like a companion of, of a journey in the sense that uh, when we look at, uh, when we walk in a museum, you know, you can look at uh, these beautifully curated uh, images or statues or sculpture, whatever the case may be, but they're carefully curated so one relates to another, and as a uh, uh, observer, we have an experience of all this brought, all this brought together. And you can think about, uh, you know, even as a chef, when you cook, you know, or I, I love to cook, so I use this metaphor uh, as well, in the sense that when we curate our, I mean, when we cook, we bring different ingredients together. We sometimes even uh, mix and match uh, different kind of food from different parts of the world. And, and this curation of all these ingredients makes the dish very uh, uh, interesting and very, uh, uh, you know, desirable. And this idea of curation is a very uh, powerful idea and important idea in today's world to understand when we talk about leading and succeeding with, uh, with other others because, you know, the silo in organization uh, – gets created because of the fact that we are not very aware of what motivates other people and how uh, it can break down uh, and create an interesting way of looking at what they can bring to the table. So today, you know, most of the people that we work with doesn't even work inside of our wall, and, and they work for other organizations, they work for other part of the world, and bringing all that stuff is the role of a, of, 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 of a leader. So in, in the context of this, this book writing that as I was explaining to you, or you know, when I can, use, I can say the same thing when we're developing products for my various companies, most of the people works for uh, you know, other organizations that we bring, to, bring them together to create this product, but they also bring different backgrounds in the sense that some of them are designers, some of them are developers, some of them are marketeers, some of them are facilitators. All that is the process of curation and is the process of creation. And, and it's very important to understand what motivates each person and highlight each person's experience 
in the process of creating this, this, uh, uh, you know, this highly uh, successful uh, outcome or successful um, you know, product or, or offering that we want to create for the rest of the world. So in that context, you know, it, it's very important to connect, shape, influence, and, and lead others by they being very direct. What is it that we want to uh, have as the end experience? So, for example, when we are creating a book, you know, you have to be very, very um, direct about what is it that you want to portray as your core message. Or when we are creating a uh, product, we want to be very direct. What what is it that we want to create? Uh, you know, uh, as 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 the experience that our end users are going to get out of it. And, and you have to almost connect with your audience, whether it's the reader or whether it's a recipient of a, a product uh, at an emotional level. If we are not connecting with people on an emotional level, uh, you know, we can't really uh, make a difference and cannot really uh, connect how people want to uh, you know, uh, utilize this offering or utilize this uh, product or utilize uh, uh, you know the the message they're getting out of out of a session or out of out of a book. So that being direct but yet very emotionally connected is a a, a key factor in terms of how we are dealing with people, but also what we want our out you know end outcome to be. And then the last uh, thing is that you know. One of the biggest learning that I have had is that whenever you are too complicated is when we fail. So, for example, uh, you know, this, this happens especially in large organizations. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, as, as you start expanding your offering and expanding your products or expanding your organization, it gets very overly complicated. Too many process, too many ideas, too many things in a product and in an offering, and it, 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 that complexity kills the idea, and it also uh, kind of uh, dis, uh, uh, you know, desalinate people. It, it breaks down the alignment. What is it that you wanted to do? So the simpler things are, the more successful they are, and the simple way interact with people, the more successful we can interact with people. So this idea of being direct, being emotionally connected, and being simple is what brings people together. And obviously, that also goes back to this idea of mindful, meaning aware of what is it that you want and what is it other people want. Combination of all that makes a successful uh, leadership process. So now we're going to move into uh, this idea of uh, value creation uh, from your authentic calling and how we want to grab people around us and then how that manifests into a, a reality or a, a, a value creation. And, uh, and you'll see the, the connection between these, these things that we just talked about, being, being mindful about our inner self and being mindful of, of other people and how does that create the value or create a, a new offering or new market, whatever the case may be. So first, let's talk about, uh, you know, what we mean by, uh, you know, th this notion of uh, creating a value. Uh, where does this come from? See, the value comes from creating new ideas and, and constantly reinventing yourself with new ideas and adding to something that already pre-exists. So Albert Einstein used to famously say that, you know, you have to be passionately curious in order to generate new ideas because knowledge is uh, something that you apply to uh, manifest a new idea. It's almost more important to create new ideas than having the knowledge to do how you're going to uh, manifest that into a reality. So, 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 the idea creation comes from being curious. And in this book, one of the things we used is, is how Da Vinci used to generate new ideas and how Da Vinci used to manifest his idea into reality. So Da Vinci, you know, as, as, as you probably know, was a Renaissance man, and he was an artist. He, was a scholar. he used to 
be an engineer. He used to be an entrepreneur because a lot of his ideas had to be funded by other people, so he had to go out there and sell his idea. So he, 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 but the key observation uh, and how he used to manifest his idea is, is one to be uh, uh, learned and applied to anything and everything that, that we do, uh, no matter what we do uh, as, a, as a living, meaning that, you know, he used to walk around in the countryside and he used to observe nature and how the nature uh, would, how the nature uh, is what taught him how to look at things and how to be curious. So, for example, I mean, you, on your screen, you may be seeing this uh, a blueprint of, of how um, light enters our eye, eye, uh, eyesight and how we look at uh, how we translate that into, into uh, how we observe. And, you know, his eye, so the, this, you know, one of the things is, is about this observing and thinking is that, you know, we talked about mindful. Being mindful is about how we look at things is what matters. You know, a lot of us see things, but not all of us can observe it keenly to, to look at, you know, to see how that can translate into, into uh, a reality. For, so, for example, I mean, we can look at a circle or we can look at a circle as a vehicle to move us forward. So, in, uh, you know, uh, so for example, in a bicycle chain where everything is connected, it gives us an ability to pull it forward. Or in this case, when you're looking at this Da Vinci's uh, 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 blueprint, you know, he used to look at how objects translate to the uh, observation of sight uh, that would allow him to, to create how things used to fly or how things used to move forward, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this keen observation process of how you look at things is what generates new ideas. So, for example, you know, we often say, why do we go to a museum or why do we take a walk? Because it cultivates our idea to create something new. And when we have these, you know, these, these ideas, that idea now needs to translate into a platform of value. So what I mean by that, so, for example, uh, as a software engineer, uh, my, my idea can translate into a platform which really a product somebody can use. But as an author, my platform is a book which is really a collection of my knowledge that uh, any reader can read it to get something out of it. So, so idea then needs to translate into a platform. So the idea could be your vision. The platform is your body that in, that uh, encapsulate all the knowledge of whatever your core competency is. So, and that applies again, whether you're an author or whether you're, or whether you're building a car or whether you're building a software, it really doesn't matter. But the idea needs to have a platform for, to create value because that's the only way other people can interact with whatever that we are, we're creating. Right, and then now next notion is that how does that platform now become accessible to the rest of the world? I mean, that's where this notion of ecosystem comes from, in the sense that if we can create a, uh, a living, breathing environment that people can interact with the platform we created, then we have a, a chance to create a, 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 a value or realize our value. So what I mean by that, so for example. Uh, you know, all of you who are dialed in and listening to me is part of the ecosystem that we just created around this new book, by, uh, which is now being facilitated by Soundview, right? So, so I had an idea of writing a book about everything connects that manifested into a book, which is published by McGraw Hill. And now Soundview has created a webinar so all of you guys can connect and listen to this, whatever I'm saying and perhaps take this idea and uh, make it a reality into your own environment. This is what I mean by ecosystem. And there are many different parties involved who are not necessarily work for one organization, but we have come together to share our ideas and to get value out of this process. That value, by the way, are not necessarily a financial value that you can realize right out of this session, but that's a value 
that can move you forward, move myself forward, move Soundview forward, move uh, Megara Hill forward. Collectively, we are that ecosystem that's creating this both tangible and intangible value that has a long-term implication as, a, as well as a short-term implication. And this long-term implication for me personally is, is, an, uh, is very important because aside from creating financial value and business value, uh, I talk about social value and social impact. The fact that we're sharing our knowledge with each other, that there is a social connotation uh, and there is a long-term impact and long-term uh, process, uh, you know, uh, alongside with this, with this, uh, um, you know, creation of, of ecosystem. It is only when we create this long-term orientation with the ecosystem, with who we are, how we connect with other people, and how we move things forward. That's when uh, 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 it, it it becomes. Uh, a reality or it becomes a, a process of, of uh, uh, value creation and both pro-business and pro-social element of what is it that we're trying to do as a leader, as a, as a person, uh, as, a cre- as a creative person, but both as a business person and somebody who's also very much in tune with whatever is happening around us. All that goes back to being mindful about who we are uh, what's around us, how we lead ourselves, how we connect our, uh, our, uh, with our audience, and how we want to, uh, uh, you know, manifest our ideas and our value into a tangible offering that can move other people forward. So I'll stop there, and we can uh, perhaps take some uh, Q&A, and then uh, I can elaborate on some of these topics even farther. All right, if you have questions for Faisal Hawk, he is the author of Everything Connects. You can ask them by using the chat window, and then you can just type your questions in there, and you'll be able to click Submit to send it to us. Uh, Faisal, let's do this, because a number of people have, have hitched onto the idea of ecosystems. I want to address those questions first, and then we'll move back into some of the other ideas that you discussed with everyone today. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay, so let's let's start with ecosystems, uh, and we'll start with the the question that came in about making the bridges that go between companies in an ecosystem. How do you go about finding connections that might not seem obvious? Um, it, you know, it, it's a great question, and in, and actually, uh, let's take a both a philosophical uh, point of view and a business point of view, right? So. Uh, in a philosophical point of view, you know, you almost have to uh, look into these things about what I talk about my, being mindful, meaning you have to be mindful what is your ultimate goal or ultimate aspiration. And that actually, believe it or not, drives where are the connection that you want to establish. So, for example, uh, if you look at myself, I make living by selling uh, you know, tangible, you know, technology product. That's how I make my living. But in order for me to, to take that, uh, t- you know, to, to, to connect with my audience, uh, I have found uh, a way to connect with them by writing, uh, you know, books and by writing uh, these kind of, uh, uh, you know, articles, whatever that I talk about whereby you say, why would a software guy would write about a book about, you know, emotional intelligence and, and leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Those are not necessarily obvious connections. But look what it has done for myself as a leader and an entrepreneur and an innovator. It has allowed me to connect with seemingly not obvious uh, uh, platforms and not obvious, uh, 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 you know, audiences. So, for example, I mean, uh, Andrew, you know this from your your travels. Uh, the people that you get in your, your, your you know in in your webinars and your they are usually uh, are typical business authors. They're not us- they're not trying to build software products. But this has given me an avenue to connect with uh, an audience that I wouldn't have connected if I was just focusing on building my software platform. Now let's take that full circle for a second because there, there are probably instances, I would imagine, 
during these interactions with people that you have, whether it's someone responding to an article or someone who has seen you speak, they may then, in the course of conversation, introduce an idea that could lead to a future software development for yourself. Absolutely. And so, and, you know, so I am constantly generating idea and I have the ability to test my idea because of, of this element, meaning writing and, and bo you know, writing and, and talk, speaking and interacting uh, in various, various, various platforms. And, and that has created that ecosystem which allowing me to promote whatever that I'm trying to do in a subtle way, uh, but it's also giving me ideas what is it that I want to create next? And what is it that, that I think that will add value to the audience that, that's, uh, uh, that's out there? So that ideation process and, and uh, pooling my constant innovation comes from interacting with a various audience group and various experience group. And one listener pointed out the fact that design thinking teaches that innovation requires empathy with the users and their environment. And so from that aspect, this, the sense of a software designer being connected to emotional intelligence makes perfect sense. So absolutely. And, you know, and, and it's, a, you know, it's that um, we now know and it's established uh, thought process that whenever we do not uh, connect emotionally with our um, end user or whatever, meaning end user in the context of not just software, think about it. A, a car's dashboard, right? I mean, when we drive our car, it, whenever it's too complicated, you know, we hate driving that car, right? Most people hate driving that car. Uh, or, you know, if, if you look at a microwave, right? If it's too many things, you know, you, you lose, lose the effectiveness of, of, of the functionality. So this awareness is what we talk about being mindful or emotionally connected with your audience, which allows us to think how we want to portray the functionality or how we want to connect with our audience through our product, which really manifests into a platform. Let's, let's follow up with another question about ecosystems because someone had asked about what's involved in maintaining the ecosystem. Can anyone truly control it? Um, actually, you don't want to control your ecosystem. You want to make it organic, right? Because that's the, you know, the idea of ecosystem comes from biology, right? Meaning that, you know, in nature uh, provides us an environment and, and it's an organic process of growth. Now, you know, uh, just like nature, uh, you know, you can destroy your ecosystem by not properly nurturing it. So you, there's a difference between controlling and nurturing. You want to nurture so there is an organic movement behind that ecosystem and people contributes and you get to contribute to the ecosystem uh, uh, on a, an innate natural way, but you really don't want to control that ecosystem because if you control, then you're not creating an ecosystem. You're almost like dictating uh, inter whether it's your internal organization or your external connection with the, with the, with the world. So from, to draw a parallel to, let's say, the world of agriculture, that, that's the equivalent of you know, attempting to have animals that are free range versus ones that are kind of controlled inside of a, a, a center where they're trying to grow them. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, like we know now much better what, why, you know, what the benefits of, uh, you know, this, this organic uh, process of growth versus inorganic. And you could look at it even a hardcore business, right? I mean, companies are often, I won't mention the name of the companies, but uh, audience, uh, you know, call them evil empires. Why do they call evil empires? Because they con try, try to control everything, right? So, and, and whenever they try to control everything, that's when they start losing their customer base and their partner base and their uh, quote-unquote ecosystem that gave him the, the original success to begin with. Can, can you, but just to help listeners a little bit, can you talk about the, the actual, the practical part of that in terms of um, how do you seek out opportunities to participate in the ecosystem? Because we're, we're not talking about control, but how do you then recognize opportunities and what steps should you take? So, um, so it, it actually goes back to that very uh, 
uh, lack of better words, uh, philosophical discussion we had about uh, being authentic, right? So, so you, you have to go in there with an authentic, authentic uh, self in the sense that uh, the way you start losing your, your ecosystem is when you are not being authentic and staying true to your calling. So, for example, if you say, look, my, you know, who I am or what my company or whatever my organization does is this one thing and this is my uh, uh, core uh, belief system and, and branding. So, for example, if you look at Apple or if you look at Nike or if you look at Netflix or even if you look at, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a particular author's brand, they are successful because they have a unique, um, uh, you know, uh, port- portrait of who they are and the value they bring to the table or how they are interacting and setting up their, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, calling out to, to the rest of the world. So first thing to realize is that you cannot be all thing to everybody. You have to have an authentic uh, value proposition or authentic calling uh, that's the first most important thing. Second is your ecosystem can support that uh, authentic calling if your authentic calling has value, meaning that, you know, why does one book become more valuable than others? Because it has an authentic message and authentic learning process, so everybody latch on to it. But when they latch on to it, other things come out of the process of, of dealing with that thing, right? So. So from that context is that that's how you control the ecosystem because you have authentic calling, but you're expanding that authentic calling by interacting with the rest of the world. But you're not losing your core value or core offering because if you do that, then you become all, all things to everybody and you start losing your you know, authenticity, right? So, so you, know, and, you know, if you look at a large company context, like I used to work in GE, or, you know, you can think about IBM or Microsoft. One of the constant criticism is that they do everything. You know, they try to do everything. And when trying to do everything, that's when you start losing your, what made you successful to begin with, right? So, so this authenticity has a very deep and very meaningful, co- you know, context, both from a personal point of view as well as an uh, organization point of view. We're talking with Faisal Hawk. He's an entrepreneur, the founder of Shadoka. He's also the author of of the book Everything Connects. What's we can we can return to this topic of ecosystems at some point if if the audience wants to continue with it. But I want to make sure we touch on some of the other areas that have been brought up by listeners. One of which is innovation. Uh, how how are we able to keep current with innovation uh, as changes are happening? so rapidly someone had asked if you could comment on that sure i mean you know this this notion of change right innovation is about change and and for most people uh it's difficult to change because you know we often feel that it's more it's safer to to uh be uh whatever made us successful and as and and just stay with it right and that's why uh, innovation is difficult both from creation point of view as well as to stay with it, right? So, for example, you know, once upon a time, meaning when in 90s, I was one of these young, you know, 20-something entrepreneurs. I'm in my 40s now. I'm no longer that, you know, that, that Silicon Valley 20-something entrepreneur. But I'm not done with my innovation. I'm, I'm constantly pushing myself uh, to be more innovative. So, So a lot of the things had to change in terms of how I used to work and and how I'm working now, and that's applicable uh, to everybody. So this open to change and constantly forcing yourself to change is what makes uh, adaptive and and to stay with innovation but also create new innovative offerings. The the way I used to develop product or the way I used to – market my offering or the way I used to write is dramatically different, uh, you know, what I did in 90s and what I'm doing now because the world has changed. We have more opportunity, more access, but also social behavior uh, is, is completely different. 
I, I would imagine as well that th that comes back to that selectivity issue that you brought up a moment ago in regards to large companies. When you're looking at innovation, no matter the size of your organization, if you're trying to be all things and know everything about what's coming in terms of innovation, you're, you're not going to succeed. Would you say that you, you need to be selective just as, as companies need to be? Absolutely. You know, and, and that also goes back to this, uh, you know, that inner and outer awareness that we talk about. So, for example, uh, you know, I mean, uh, imagine the way we used to, uh, you know, reach out to people uh, 10 years ago versus now, right? I mean, we use social media extensively now for business purposes and to generate ideas and communicate, et cetera, et cetera, right? Before, we used to do it very differently, right? So, so this inner and outer awareness uh, uh, is what drives the, the change and what happens in a lot of times in large organizations like I, you know, uh, what I used to see in, in places like GE and, and, and uh, Pepsi and other, other places. I mean, you get very much inward focus and you forget what's going on in the rest of the world and it passes you by. Right. So, I mean, you even even heard uh, Eric Schmidt talking about, I meaning Google, talking about the fact that they feel that they missed out on the social uh, media movement and, and they caught, uh, you know, it, it passed them by. And, they, they, and so it's difficult uh, to stay with whatever that is happening, but it only can come from if you are utterly aware of what is it that you want to be but also what is going on the rest of the world. And that's why this notion of everything connects. What's going on inside of you also has to connect with what's going on outside of you. And then following up on that idea, a listener had also asked about how to make innovation as part of a habit or part of the culture of your company. What are your thoughts on that, Faisal? See, and, and, you know, I drew up on uh, a lot of Eastern philosophy, as you know, from reading the book. Uh, you know, this notion of ritualistic behavior, which I, uh, you, you know, I, I, I adopted a Eastern philosophical term called devotion. Uh, you know, this ritual, you have to be very devotional about innovation and creativity, right? You have to nurture it. So, for example, uh, you know, and, you know, and, and, you know I mean, uh, uh, a writer becomes only better writer when he writes every day at a certain time. Same way, if you want to become a better coder, uh, you have to repeatedly code and learn new techniques and new, new tricks and whatever is going on in terms of outside world, apply that. But you have to be ritualistic and devotional about creativity and uh, uh, innovation. And you have to take time to do that. You cannot say, well, I, got, I have to put out this fire, I have to go on this, I have to deal with my people. If you do that, you're not going to innovate. And there's a difference between innovation, creativity, uh, uh, and leading versus managing, right? And so, you know, and, and there's different roles, by the way. And one of the things we argue uh, in the book is the fact that the way to stay fresh is that forget about the definition of your uh, you know, job title, if, when you start thinking about playing different roles, meaning you can be a creator and you can be a builder and you can be a marketeer, and as you look at these roles and rotate these roles, that's when you become devotional by bringing inner, you know, your inner passion along with whatever is going on outside and be creative and be innovative and stay with change constantly. If you visit, uh, if you visit Faisal on Twitter, he's uh, Faisal underscore Hawk, you'll be able to see, uh, he tweeted, I think it was yesterday, uh, a clip from an interview that he and I conducted a short while ago in which he discusses that more in detail about this notion of not being so tied to title and the power that comes from being able to be rotated through a variety of roles. And in some cases, it's, it's project by project. Um, so I, I'd recommend everyone, everyone visit that once we're wrapped up here today and, and take a look. Uh, let me move into a question that came up about, we have a couple questions about entrepreneurship. And in one in particular, you're the perfect person to ask because you not only have had 
extensive experience from the startup side, but you also worked with GE and you've, you've worked with larger companies in the past. Uh, this, you hear a lot, someone said you hear a lot about major organizations that look to adopt principles from the startup world. Did you apply aspects of large companies during your startup phase? Yes, I, I've done both, uh, you know, because, so for example, uh, if you look at an entrepreneur, right, especially the first-time entrepreneur, and this is not an age thing, you can be a first-time entrepreneur in your 20, 20s or you can be a first entrepreneur in, in your, uh, you know, 50s or 60s. And by the way, the definition of entrepreneurship has also changed because there, is, there are intra entrepreneurs that exist within large organizations that's trying to move things forward. The definition of entrepreneurship is such that, you know, you're trying to do, you know, very creative stuff with very limited resource. That's really the basic definition of entrepreneurship. But so, so if you look at from that point of view, so uh, if you want to adopt a, 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 you know, a large company mentality in a small um, you know, uh, entrepreneurial environment, what that will give you is the discipline in the sense that, you know, I mean, think about uh, you know, what happens in a large company if you want to push a project forward. You have to go and convince your boss, and then you have to have, uh, have an investment community, committee that may – approve the funding for the projects you're trying to do. By the way, that's exactly what you're doing in a small entrepreneurial environment as well, in the sense that you have to put together your offering, you have to put together a pitch, and then you have to sell that to either to an investor or to a uh, customer or a partner, whatever the case may be. Even when you write a book, you are actually going through an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial process because you're saying, hey, I have an idea. Here's my, uh, you know, outline of the book, and here's my proposal. As I have to now create a proposal, I have to go to a, a publisher and I have to sell my idea, and they're going to buy that, and then the book becomes a reality, right? So everything is an entrepreneurial process, but the both the idea generation and the discipline of large scale mentality, uh, you know, meaning what you typically find in the large organization actually applies, and most entrepreneur fails or, or doesn't have the ability to scale something because they don't apply the discipline of uh, that kind of process-centric behavior. So it's the creativity and the process when it comes together, that's when really the companies uh, succeed large or small. So that kind of mentality applies in both, both point of view. Now, one last question, and, and then we'll wrap up, and it addresses, again, from an entrepreneur's standpoint, the issue of staffing, and I think this is a, a good one to close with. You, you had talked about curating a, a committed group to be able to get together and rally around projects or ideas. Someone had asked, we're, we're able to attract the talent that matches our passion level. It's the commitment to, st to stay with us that tends to wane. Many of the people whom we've hired have eventually left to t attempt to form their own startups. And what the question is, how can we hang on to them, or do we want to hang on to them? You know, it's a very difficult and a complex question, and what I have learned is that you have to define what is it that you all ultimately want to gain. So what I mean by that, do you, want to, uh, do you want to have access to the talent or do you want them to work for you and that is the only way to access them? In my case, you know, I was able to access the talent even when they left me to do their own thing. Actually, I encouraged them to go and do their own thing. But that doesn't mean that I cannot tap into that talent. So, for example, you know, I mean, you know, I just written this book with, with – uh, with somebody, and most likely he and I are not going to write our next book together. But that's okay. And he doesn't work for me. We're going to write a book maybe two years later on a separate topic. But this, the, you have to, you know, it's, you know, if you look at movie industry, they have mastered this art of, uh, uh, you know, bringing people together uh, whenever they need, and different people play different roles for different movies but they don't lose that relationship. It's much more about relationship versus who works for who 
And and the only way we can tap into those raw people is only when they work for you, and there is no other way to work with them. That's a false notion. And and when we think that way, then that's how we try to control the ecosystem. You want your people to go away and do great things so that you can create even a bigger ecosystem. Right? So so it's a slightly different way of thinking. This has been a very thought-provoking conversation, and again, you're focusing on yourself and your place within your organization, and also how your organization and you are part of that bigger ecosystem. Faisal Hawk, thank you so much for being with us today on Soundview Live. Thank you so much for having me. Now, if you'd like more information, you can visit Faisal online at FaisalHawk.com or at Shadoka.com. You can also uh, visit his book's website, EverythingConnects.com, the book that Faisal co-authored with Drake Bear. And we'd like to thank Faisal for joining us today, and special thanks to McGraw-Hill, the publisher of Everything Connects. Thank you, as always, to Ursula Sharp, the executive producer of our program. Music.